of termination first. Uh, the first two leaves come up. Um, how about now? Can anyone identify this? Still pretty challenging. Okay. So now we're at the child stage. We've got a little more leaves exposing. We're getting a little bit more information. We have some kind of pointed tips on the uh, leaf structure, a tap root. Does that give us any clues? At least leaning in the right direction. Do we think it's a grass or a flower? Flower. flower. Okay, good. So we're starting to get more information as time goes on. How about in this stage? This gives you a little bit more. Back to the sunflower? No, right here. No. Oh, we got a winner. We got a first. <laughs> Good. So this is what I would consider a teenage plant. It hasn't done this uh, first bloom yet. They call it basket flower because look at the seed. Uh, itself is wrapped in what looks like a woven basket before it blooms. That's the bloom about to come out. If you look at it from the bottom, very similar. That's that basket shape. <clears throat> and finally, in this instance, do you think, uh, how many of you could have identified that seed at this stage? Yes, a lot more. So me being a seed guy, I'm pretty jealous of plants because plants get all the recognition and no one knows any of the seeds, you know. But, um, the, the whole point of, that I'm trying to make and get across is that if you have a little patience and shift your perspective through time and space, you'll realize that you know things that you don't really know at that point in time. And so we're going to do that same uh, little test here. And I've tried in the past, I'm a bit in the past, I'm a big numbers guy. And so they say numbers sell benefits. I mean, uh, benefits tell number benefits sell numbers tell. And uh, I've always focused on the numbers, but we're going to go here and try and focus on the benefits. And uh, for the remainder of the talk, I will refer to seeds as plants and plants as seeds. Without seeds, you don't have plants and vice versa. So the benefit of the seed is the same as the benefit of the flower. Maybe not in that instance, but throughout time, those benefits could be realized. So to really understand the value of seeds, we need to go back in time and zoom out our perspective. This is a field of basket flower. So zooming out, this is actually uh, harvested up in the panhandle near good old Texas Tech. Uh, this was back in 2014. You can see this is a wild harvest. This was not grown or produced. One of the things we like to specialize in is scouting from the air and finding wild harvest sites to get local genetics. But that's really just going to give us a perspective of trying to understand basket flower. And what I want to go over is all seeds what the value that all seed brings. Um, here's an eco-region map of Texas. Let's try this again, raising your hand. Does anyone know what eco-region we are currently sitting in? Oh, right here, young man. The Edwards Plateau. Oh, oh, he beats me right now. He got a seed back himself. Good. Brandon. So correct, Edwards Plateau right here in the center of Texas. Um, let's do another one. Does anyone know how many ecoregions there are in Texas? Seven. Ten. Sarah, you kind of raised your hand there. You did a little, you half raised. I'll actually, I'll accept two to three answers. It's kind of debatable depending on which you answer. Yeah, so we count 13. In this picture, I think there's 13, but there are 11. So Sarah gets one over here. Texas, if you zoom out and you look at the whole southern United States, at least in this picture, is a rather diverse uh, ecosystem of a state. There's many different soil types and land landscape features that aren't prevalent in other uh, states. Edwards Plateau is like the king of Texas in the sense that there's 13 ecoregions and eight of them intersect with the Edwards Plateau, which is where we are sitting. Believe it or not, it's one of the top 10 biodiversity hotspots in this continent. So what you guys are doing here in this chapter is very important for the preservation of the biodiversity that we're trying to sustain, especially through this upcoming population boom that is expected. So, um, <clears throat> I am getting a little sidetracked though, because I wanted to talk about the benefits of seeds. We still haven't zoomed out enough yet. Let's zoom out one more. Here we are on good old planet Earth. And you think, you must think that plants are uh, only growing on Earth, as far as we know. So that should be zoomed out enough, but I like to take things to the next level. Raising your hand here, can anyone tell me what is moving through space right now? 
Yeah. You guys yes. Planets and what? And what do you call that? Planets and sun. Oh, ding, ding, ding. He's got time. We're about to beat all y'all. <laughs> so, the solar system, that is the correct answer. Looks something, a lot of people look at it like this, but this is actually what is moving through space looks like, which is really uh, just like that. Here. But the solar system, you can see that everything's revolving around the sun. Another opportunity for a seed packet. Why is it called the solar system? What what value does the solar part provide? Sun. Sun. What does sun provide? Energy. Energy. Good. So go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> energy. The sun is what provides energy for the entire solar system. And if you think that that's the case, then that must mean that sun provides the entire energy for the Earth, correct? Correct. That is correct. But can we eat sunlight for breakfast? Can we survive on sunlight? No. So the sun is a source of the energy, but we, it is in a form that we are not able to use it called photons. Photons are sent from the sun to the Earth. I think it's 193 million miles in 8 minutes and 20 seconds. 24-7, that energy is hitting the Earth's surface. Some of it's reflected, but some of it is absorbed through planets. Does anyone know what that process is called? Oh, we got one. Photosynthesis. Yeah, you got your hand raised it up back <laughs> earlier over there. Photosynthesis. Good. That is a process where a plant captures sunlight or photons, carbon dioxide, and water to produce oxygen and carbohydrates. So photosynthesis. Um, let's see. How do I want to go about this? I guess we might as well just give out another packet. Can anyone tell me what three things are essential for human life? Air, food. Yeah, you, yeah, you're on the right track. Three things. You got two: air, food, and water. And water. That's it. So, isn't it pretty interesting in the sense that plants, plants, some bacteria and uh, ferns and mosses and stuff like that, but the majority of the volume is plants are the only species that are able to photosynthesize, which means capture the sunlight's energy, transform that energy into something usable for humans and all other species. Not only that, is that plants breathe the exact opposite of we do. They take in carbon dioxide and they emit oxygen. We breathe oxygen, we emit uh, carbon dioxide. So that is what we call a mutually beneficial relationship. And that is what nature strives for in trying to find balance and where things are working together, where one waste is another things value. <clears throat> so considering that plants are the only species, for the most part, that are able to produce oxygen and take the sunlight in and transform it into usable food, how is it that we do not respect plants to the level that at least I think that we should, which we'll get into that a little bit uh, later. Um, so talking about oxygen, now going a little bit more into the food web. So here is a diagram of a prairie food web and uh, shows plants, butterflies, beetles, snakes, birds, kind of a whole web interconnected. Does anyone know what is unique about the plants in this picture compared to the other species? They're native. They're native. That's a good thing, but I mean, the species are actually native. Keep going. And convert sunlight to energy. That is the to answer on the back end. But what is this diagram showing that the hawk has and the plants don't? Yes, ma'am. The plant, everything else depends on the plant. Yes, all of the arrows from the plants are flowing outward, right? <clears throat> so if the arrows are only flowing out from the plants, what does that mean? If you look at that on a whole nother diagram, um, yeah. they're the base of the entire food chain. It's the same sense that they take in carbon dioxide and produce oxygen. They're taking in sunlight and producing food. Nothing else can produce food like plants on this, on this planet. <clears throat> and uh, this is, I mean, this in itself is remarkable. But then you want to go to the next level. This is... This is what really sold me on natives. And, you know, I was born into a native seed company, but I didn't really get it till I was probably 20, which is about 10, 15 years ago. And Douglas Talmy, I don't know if you guys have read him. I think that's the book. One of the books that he wrote is uh, 
being given away. I'd highly recommend all of his work, but he explained it the best. And I'm sorry, I probably won't do him as much service, but plants are the primary producers. They take that sunlight, they turn it into food, and the very next level right here, which is level two, are the primary consumers. The majority of those primary consumers are insects. And insects have co-evolved with these plants over thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of years. And that is called specialization, which looks something like this. What that means is that these plants and these insects have mutually beneficial relationships. The plants use the insects for pollination. The insects use the plant for food. They're working together. Obviously, this is a Gallardia moth on top of the Gallardia Coachella Indian blanket plant. And those, I mean, it's pretty evident that those have worked together for thousands and thousands of years. Um, and the difference between natives and non-natives is in this one um, process called specialization right here. The fact that these plants have co-evolved over thousands of years, but only within the last 500 or so years have we really settled this continent, have we transferred plants from all over the world to try and come here and displace the natives. And the extent of the displacement is, is, I don't know any other word than horrendous. It's been calculated that less than one-tenth of one percent prairie remains. I mentioned that I was a numbers guy, and uh, I talk about numbers all day long, love spreadsheets and all that. But when you say less than one-tenth of one percent, you know it's bad, but you don't really know how bad it is until you're a human and you start thinking about money. So let's say one tenth of 1%. If you took every $100 in your banking account and you said, I don't want a dollar bill, I wanna turn it all into pennies. 100 times 100, anyone do math quick? I'll give a packet out for that. 10,000, someone back there, whoever said that first, go ahead. 10,000, so you have a $100 bill, now you're changing that in for 10,000 pennies. One tenth of 1% is taking 9,999 of those pennies and putting it into the soil and plowing it under. That's effectively what we have done to our tall grass prairies. Back in before the 1400s, those 10,000 pennies are what represented our tall grass prairies. And now we have one penny left trying to do all the same jobs that those 10,000 pennies were doing. Imagine the consequences that has caused to us, not only for infiltration and all the other benefits that plant bring, but also the insect specialization. How many other species have suffered because of that? And the thing that I say is horrendous about it, which I myself is guilty, is the fact that the reason we're doing that is that we are overvaluing our comfort and our convenience and undervaluing other biodiversity of life. We really all do have the choice in here to make that change, but it's so hard because it's just a simple, you know, let me drive to the grocery store or let me pave over this or whatever it is. It's all about convenience for us and us as the human species. Um, I believe it was in our spring catalog, which there are some, still some over there if you'd like to pick it up. Uh, Bill, my dad, writes the introductory stories, and uh, it's about fast, cheap, and good. I don't know if y'all have heard that, but you have a triangle, fast, cheap, and good, and you get to pick two. And what we have done as humans, we want things fast and we want things cheap, but you can't have all three, so you're taking away from the good. And what we're seeing now is the after effects in my opinion, of removing all of this biodiversity. We have hotter climates, we have less water supplies, we have less species in decline, I mean, more species in decline, less overall species. And it really, really needs to start, the change of that is in a room like this, where people are highly passionate about bringing this stuff back and protecting it. I mentioned earlier that the population boom coming, apparently by 2050, the hill country is gonna double. And what is gonna happen to our biodiversity in our species here if we don't do something about it now. <laughs> That's right. It's up to you. <laughs> so that was one specialization. We talked about monarchs. It's obviously a, a pretty hot topic. Um, it, it, this uh, butterfly is another species that is highly specialized in the fact that it only uses one plant family to lay its eggs on. Anyone know what that is? Milkweed. 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 Someone got it. Okay, I'll tell you what. Yeah, there you go. Okay, Give one. Anyone know what the Latin name of milkweed family is? Asclepius. There you go. Give her one right there. It's not a family. Oh, see how can we do this? I mean, I don't know. It's just a nomenclature, right? It's a <laughs> 
<laughs> so this is a monarch butterfly and what looks like a showy milkweed. Um, and what happens is that this monarch butterfly can use the pollen for resources, but it must lay its eggs on this plant because when those eggs hatch, they turn into caterpillars and those caterpillars need something to eat. Those plants have evolved chemical defenses against other insects. This caterpillar has co-evolved with it to allow it to eat that uh, milkweed plant so it can turn into a chrysalis and a beautiful butterfly. Problem with that is that since 1994, there's been a pretty steep decline of butterflies uh, populations. And I would venture to say that the majority of that uh, problem is caused by humans, which is pretty standard in this talk that we're gonna be going over. But um, the main yeah, thing about that, I mean, if you even think milk weed, what do we name it? We called it weed because we as humans think it is a weed. Uh, it is pretty prevalent in the in the prairie in the Corn Belt region. And um, dang, I didn't put that picture on. If y'all ever seen the milkweed seed, there's a pretty thin, flat, papery looking oval seed, but it's very thin and it has a big old furry, almost looks like down comfort feathers and helps it move. So that helps that seed disperse over wide distances. In the past, farmers had trouble controlling that species because it would move all over the place if they couldn't control it with conventional agricultural uses or herbicides until around 1994, when you see this graph dipping, Monsanto came up with um, Roundup Ready crops, which means they could plant corn, soybeans, all that stuff, and spray Roundup over it, which is a non-selective herbicide, which kills everything, but it would not kill the crops that they planted. <clears throat> if you see this, use of that in millions of pounds has increased fivefold in those 20 years. This is what we would call a direct inverse relationship, where things are not working together, but they're working against each other. The problem here is we are accelerating our use. The decline of monarchs is accelerating. I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here, but I mean, we need to get past the point of only preaching. I think preaching is a good place to start. Somehow we need to figure out how to make actions. And I don't want to end that on a negative note because there are um, organizations like Xerxes or the Monarch Watch or all those that are actually focused on that. So take a Lady Bird Johnson quote and where flowers bloom so does hope and try and look at the positives now we talked about oxygen and food which plants are basically support all human life on those levels how about water oh, good i got a question that's non-plant related anybody in here like science or physics i bet fifth grade i get this i don't know this one's kind of confusing <laughs> Does anyone know the first law of thermodynamics? Energy cannot be created nor destroyed. Only be transformed. Good, nice. So energy is not created or destroyed. Think about that sunlight. Photons are coming from the sun and there's a certain amount of energy coming from that. It's being converted into a different type of energy that we can use. You might have heard that water is running out. Water is called a water cycle because it is constantly transforming between water, which is liquid, gas, form, which is fog or condensation, and then um, solid form, which is ice. And the problem is, it's the same problem that we have with energy, that when it comes to the earth, we can't use it. Water in the ocean, it's water, but we can't use it. It's not water usable to us. Water and ice caps aren't usable. 60 to 65% of our water comes from groundwater. So what helps support increased groundwater? Here's a cross-sectional cut of a prairie in Kansas. <clears throat> I think those deep tap roots, it looks like a silphium. Yeah, that's a silphium compass plant, probably. There's a lot of other fibrous roots in there, fibrous root systems. And if you think of the surface of uh, the earth, the crust, it, it is almost like a sponge. A wet, wet sponge holds a lot of water, has a lot of holes in it, keeps the earth cool, um, allows a good growing uh, environment for subsoil species like worms and a bunch of other things. And what have we done? with those areas, fast forward a little bit. That's what we call porous in the last, right? Um, that we have holes that we can soak things up. But what we decided to do with the 9,999 other pennies, pave it over. Anyone ever poured water on pavement? Hmm. It just flows right over it and it goes to the path of least resistance. So if 60 to 65% of our groundwater, I mean, of our water use comes from groundwater, 
why are we immediately trying to put it in a gutter, put it in a river, and put it in the ocean to get out of our reservoirs? We are working against ourselves in these problems. So, other plant benefits, if that wasn't enough, the majority, this is, I don't know, that's not the coolest graphic, but the majority of uh, medicine comes from plants. 94% of our houses built in 2022 came from wood, which is a plant. Uh, just beauty in itself, there's been numerous studies talking about people in hospital rooms that have access to green spaces heal much quicker. I think if most likely you are in this room because you think that uh, nature is comforting and relaxing, and anytime you would like to think of something like that, you probably would not be under human light, but out in natural sunlight and plants are what captures that. So facts tell, benefits sell, that's what it was. So here's all the benefits of plants. Now what we're going to do, instead of just talking about what they're capable of, is how to get uh, these plants into action. Um, but I guess before that, to sum it all up, David Attenborough um, quoted, plants are the lungs of the earth, providing the oxygen we breathe and the foundation of the food chain that sustains all life. They are the silent, steadfast guardians of our planet, integral to the web of life in ways we are only beginning to understand. So, <clears throat> To understand seeds and how they work, I think we should first uh, take a little look at their anatomy. Um, let's start from the inside. Seeds, actually, it's, it's, it's a vessel of life. There's already a baby that has been fertilized that is inside, which is the plumule, hypocotyl, and radical all combined right there. That's what actually turns into the plant. But then there's a cotyledon, which is that white area, which is stored energy and that will help it sustain itself over multiple years until the conditions are right for germination, and a seed coat that will protect it against some other variables. <clears throat> now, seeds are very, very interesting in the way that they uh, have genetically adapted to uh, help their species survive over different, different environmental challenges. So we'll get into that a bit, but I'd like to give another, another seed packet away. This cotyledon, there's two types of seeds. Does anyone know what those are? Mono and di. Monocot and dicot. So, yeah. <laughs> and you want to hear the Joel? I don't want to get too far into the anatomy of that. There's not a ton of difference other than the way that it, it emerges. So, um, we can go ahead and get into. Oh, here's some chance to win some packets. <laughs> the mini seed design. So, we're going to show a picture of a seed a picture of a plant, and then talk a little bit about that seed and why it might have uh, formed its coat in that manner and what some of the adaptations could uh, benefit. So we'll do the hand raising thing, make sure we're all on the same page here. If you think you know it by the seed, raise your hand. If you think you know it by the plant, raise your hand. First come, first serve, starting off. Anyone know that seed? Blue bonnet. There we go. State flower of Texas. Texas blue bonnets. If you've ever seen any of these, come. there we go. Good. Texas blue bonnets is, uh, I think it's also very interesting. So when we are trying to calculate seeding rates, we have to get down to a level. And basically the way that we do it is how many seeds per square foot you're putting out. And so each, we for humans, it's easy to measure things on weight. So, uh, we, we have to do all the math to figure out how many seeds are in a pound and how many seeds you put or pounds you put out per area. So blue bonnets is rather on the low side. One of our lowest seeds is Eastern Gamma Grass has about 7,000 seeds per square foot, I mean, per pound. Um, Texas blue bonnets is about double that. Anyone notice, I mean, what does that look like? And go beans. Gravel. Beans, gravel. I think it looks like gravel. Yeah. And if you ever held them, I actually have some in my bag. You can look at after if you'd like. Um, it is. They're really hard seed coats. You can put them in your mouth. Whenever we do tests out on wild harvest, we'll do some of that to see how hard the coat is and how long it takes to break down. And it'll be in your mouth for about five minutes till it finally kind of starts softening up. But if you look at that picture, too, this is all seed from the same lot, the same field. And you'll see that some of these seeds are dark, some are red, some are light, some have spots. Um, and I believe, I mean, this is just kind of experience in the field and hearing stories from uh, others in our company, that these either evolved or have uh, 
greatly thrive in the Atlanta uplift. And the Atlanta uplift is notorious for a bunch of granitic soils, which is a hard environment. And if you know anything about stratification and scarification, blue bonnets uh, improve germination when they're scarified. And if they're in granitic soils and they're being blown around with wind and rubbing against granite, that is scratching that outside seed coat, which is allowing water and nutrients to get in so they will germinate. But naturally, I believe that the seeds on themselves, they have different colors, different styles, and they're really hard like that because they're trying to protect themselves through uh, multi-year environmental challenges. If you had a plant that had a thousand babies, you don't want to have all those babies that come up the first year because what happens if a fire or a flood or something comes out and it wipes all of them out? I believe the seeds have genetically adapted so that some have harder seed coats than others. That they will, one will come up in this condition, one will come up in that condition, and they will protect themselves throughout many years to have a long-term stable community of that plant. So that's just one example. Let's go to another one. Anyone know this one? Um, no. How about whenever you look at the actual plant? Very skinny. Close. It is definitely a short grass like sun. Buffalo grass. Buffalo grass. Good. Buffalo grass is interesting in the fact that there are uh, two sexes to the plant. There's a male and a female. <clears throat> one that produces pollen and one that is the seed that you see here that is at the bottom and catches that pollen to be fertilized. <clears throat> Buffalo grass, I believe, is trying to do, well, let me back up a bit. You can see in the back there, there's some really dark green. Naturally, uh, those seeds aren't that green, but in the industry, what we as humans want to do is rush and push things through, just like scarifying uh, blue bonnets. We want to try and get those buffalo grass to germinate quickly because we're trying to control the environment. And to do that, we uh, treat this or coat it with something called potassium nitrate, KNO3. And what that does is help break down that seed coat. I believe that blue, uh, buffalo grass is similar to blue bonds in the fact that it creates a waxy kind of exterior, something that I would relate almost to a cedar tree in the fact that it it is trying to prolong its life in the soil so that over multiple years it, these seeds will come up. Um, the difference in uh, it is trying to, I guess the point I'm trying to say is that it's trying to accomplish the same thing as blue bonnets, but in a completely different way. Notice how there's 42,000 seeds per pound of this one. So it's almost three times that of blue bonnets. You get a pound of buffalo grass, you get a pound of blue bonnets, you can get three times the seed on the buffalo grass on the blue bonnets. Does anyone know, another math question, kind of geometry, how many um, square feet there are in an acre? 43,000. That's it on the dot. <laughs> so buffalo grass. <laughs> Bubble grass, a good one to know is uh, if you put that out at about a pound per acre, you're going to get one seed per square foot. And you might think, oh, that's great. If I get one seed per square foot and it turns into a plant, I'm on my way. But as I just mentioned, not all of those seeds are going to germinate the first year. There's a whole testing process that could go. I mean, it's a lot of math. I love that stuff, but I've talked to people and it just goes right over their head. It could be a whole presentation in itself. Um, generally, Buffalo grass, you want about 20 to 25 seeds per foot. If you're doing a turf setting where you want something really thick and you're close around your house, you might go as high as 150 seeds per foot. So all these plants have different growing habits and nutrient needs and how much volume and area they're going to take up. Do they have different seed amounts? Yeah. How about this one? I know. I know that too. Nature seed? Huh? Nature seed? Nature? No. I don't know what that is, but no, it's not that one. You give up on the seed? You want to see the picture of the plant? You want a cornflower? Yes. What is it? Leatris. There we go, right here. Leatris. It's a gay feather. <clears throat> gay feather, there's a little bit of adaptation that, that those seeds have gone through. Um, oh, that's my little nephew fisherman there, too. So, gay feather, they have. You can see that some of those arms have come off, but these have these little fuzzy things. A lot of times, seeds, you can see, I mean, burr clover is a notorious one, or uh, uh, beggar's lice, and the fact that they focus on their dispersal and their uh, expansion of their, their genetics through attaching to animals' hide and then being dropped off at some other point. So, gay feather, that's almost 
two and a half times the uh, the buffalo grass seeds per pound. So now we're at 110,000, right? <clears throat> How about this one? This one's one of my favorites. I'm really putting the test, the pressure on you guys. Yeah, yielded gum yield trion looks almost like it. What? It's like a bed of one of the trions. Yeah, they're close. Mm -hmm. No, three on, three on, three on. Right here for Joel. He, he will get that close enough. So it's a uh, purple uh, grass. This is something we would call early, an earlier successional species, uh, in the sense that it tries to. Uh, Anytime there's a disturbance, it's trying to find that disturbance and, and put its roots down quickly to hold the soil down and start rebuilding the soil. So purple three on here. The other unique thing about this one uh, is that it's hard to see. This one here, you can see this is a seed head. At the end is a point. And on this side, there's three ons. That's what's called purple three on. <clears throat> and those ons are, when they're first formed, they're like this. And over time, they start getting horizontal. And one, these will attach in uh, animals' fur, like the previous one. But two, wind will help this move as well. It almost acts like a little floating top or something. But when it actually lands into a soft spot of dirt and that point is in the ground, that wind will start turning those ons and drilling that seed into the ground itself. <laughs> so we start off with uh, uh, Texas Blue Bonnets had 15,000 seeds per pound. This one has 33,000. So that's what, 22 times the amount. You put one pound out per acre, you have 22 seeds per square foot. Keep going up. We got a lot more than have more seeds per pound. Ooh, this one's tricky. But if you get the right family, I'll give it to you. No? This is a pretty prominent uh, family. Bushy blue stem or call something else down, coastal or something. Right? Whatever's up there. Broomside blue stem, very similar to bushy. Bushy and broomside are pretty similar. Bushy is a little bit more water um, from the plant. This one is also very, very light and fluffy, tends to uh, be dispersed by wind, very uh, higher seed count. Um, and I, I guess I kind of need to give you guys a range that 15,000 of the Texas blue bonnets is pretty low seed count per pound in the sense it's a heady seed, it's high density. And that means it takes a lot to break that dormancy, uh, that, that seed coat open. The broom sedge blue stem, I would say that's medium high. I would say probably on average on all the seeds that we carry, there's somewhere between three and 400,000 seeds per pound. So this one's getting on up there. Uh, you put this out on an acre, you're getting about 20 seeds per square foot. I might have messed up my calculation on my last one. 20 seeds per square foot, about. <laughs> um, how about another one? Good luck figuring this one out by the seed. Sesame. I'm tiny. This one's almost like sand. That's true. That's right. How about from the picture? Sand. It looks like standing cypress, which is that what you said? Yeah, it looks like it, doesn't it? Uh, admittedly, I don't know too much about this plant either. I've only seen it in the wild a couple of times. It is cardinal flower, which is a localia. Oh, it grows in the riparian areas. Uh, I had another picture on here of standing cypress, I mean, not standing cypress, uh, sand drop seed. <clears throat> and typically, there's another thing to think about. Okay, this one has 6,400,000 seeds per pound. You cover a lot of area with one pound. But it's really hard to get a pound of this, which is why the price is, I don't know, a lot. We, I don't even think we sell this one by the pound. <clears throat> but a lot of these seeds, when you start zooming in out your perspective, you go back and you look at that blue bonnet. It has a big seed coat. It has a big cotyledon, so it has a lot of energy stored in there. Its ability to push up through the soil and last for long periods of time is increased. These that have very, very sm small seeds, typically they have small seed coats. They germinate rather quickly. These are what I would consider an early successional species, although I'm not sure if this one is, but something like sand drop seed would be, in the fact that it is trying to get in and get established quickly, and its game of continuing its genetics is in numbers, right? It's completely different than blue bonnets in the sense that it's going to try and last a long time. This one's just going to try and make a lot of babies so that it will keep coming back year after year by, by just sheer volume. So... A little bit of the seed anatomy, but what our strategy is at Native American Seed is instead of just picking one seed, trying to combine all the benefits of a bunch of diversity. Remember that the insects co-evolve with the plants. Uh, each plant has different root systems. Each plant 
benefits uh, the environment differently, and each plant responds to the climate conditions differently. The value of having a diverse ecosystem is that you have a diverse uh, food web that is supported by it, and each year as climate change, something else will show itself in that mix. So if you're ever trying to do restoration or even do landscaping, we, we highly recommend doing mixes for this, this uh, reason. So now that we know a little bit about the seeds and the anatomy, let's get into actually planting. And this is a, a, kind of an example of what that mix would look like, although I don't know, that's different. Uh, here we go. I got one. Can anyone name that seed? Sample. Whoever said antelope wanted it's a milkweed of some sort, but uh, it might be green milkweed. And speaking of, you mentioned earlier that um, there were no milkweeds this year. And for us, we actually found the opposite. And the trick is there's not, they're not really accessible and there's definitely less of a population than it used to be. It's just spread out and you have to find where those pockets are. And, you know, someplace, I mean, it seems like when you're a farmer, it rains all around you, it never rains on you. I think that it really does move around, you know, but um, this year we happened to find a green milkweed field uh, up in the Dallas area. We're doing some work up there anyways. On the way home, we found a field and collected 130 pounds of green milkweed, which for us is quite a bit. And we were able to find 13 pounds of antelope horns, which is also quite a bit. If you know a pound of that, it's close to $1,000 a pound, so it's, it's hard to get. That. I mean, all of it's hand collected. It's a lot of work. But... They are still trying to fight and survive, and I think it is up to us uh, to continue their, their genetics in that population. And that's really what we see the benefit that we as a company provide is trying to hold on to these species that are in decline. And to survive, we have to charge money for it because it costs us money, but we're doing the best we can to try and create it in a, a valuable and economic uh, value to you guys. But if you really go back and look at what the value seeds bring in the long term, I mean, in the big scope of things, it's really cheap at what we're talking about. I mean, we're spending billions of dollars on oh, football players that want to, you know, whatever. And I used to be a football, so that's my whole life. But just trying to shift our perspective and what is valuable to our species, humans, to survive. So... Let's see if this actually works. Uh, we have a little video here, a time lapse. Uh, I'm going to speed it up double time because I don't want to spend too much time on it, but it's basically just showing the seed germinating. And I'm going to try and uh, um, annotate during some of that. I have to come up here. I was afraid this wouldn't work. Let's try some. Can I get on the internet from here? Does anyone know? You can sometimes. <laughs> you can sometimes. Let's see if this works. Oh, that's a good. Uh, okay, that might not work. Then I guess I'll just explain the video. You know, they say a picture's worth a thousand words. And I already speak fast enough as it is, so I'm going to have to speak really fast to get this point across. On this germination, it's already too bad. Bad. Okay, so. There we are. All right, so um, we mentioned earlier that, oh, no, I didn't mention it. I can go ahead and do that now. We said what three things human needs for survival. We said what plants provide for us, which are those three things. What do plants need, or seeds, sorry, seeds need to germinate? To germinate only. There's three things. Three things. Uh-huh. I'm going to guess soil, light up, and water. You got one of them. Water? Yeah, so a lot of these, we think we know these things. And, you know, going, that's why I like doing putting presentations together. I don't know how to say I like it. I don't do them that often, but I enjoyed this one because I learned quite a bit going back and thinking I knew something that I didn't. So water is one thing that a seed needs. But think about soil. You can put seeds on a paper towel and sprout them, right? Okay. So they need water. 
Oxygen. Oxygen, good. They do need oxygen because that cotyledon is stored energy. And since they are not photosynthesizing yet, because they don't have a leak structure, then they need to utilize that energy through respiration, which is oxygen. <clears throat> what else do they need? Warmth. Warmth, perfect. So there's really two uh, general uh, categories of seeds, especially in Texas, um, in the sense that we have cool season and warm season species. Cool season, for the most part, are wildflowers. Um, there are some exceptions of cool season grasses, but they're wildflowers, and those typically either need to go through a cooled spell or will ge uh, germinate in between about 40 and 70 degrees soil temperature. So soil temperature, not air temperature. Then we have warm season species like buffalo grass, or most of our grasses are warm season, and those germinate in the higher ranges at 70 plus. And the reason for the temperature is that uh, to activate the seed and that cotyledon and that energy, you need water to get it going and you need uh, the correct temperature because enzymes are what start the energy process. And enzymes, certain enzymes only activate in certain temperature ranges and each one has adapted for that reason. Um, one of the things I wanted to explain about this video with the seed germinating, too bad, but you know, the seed is underneath the soil right here. <clears throat> If you watch the first, whenever it first starts moving, the very first thing is it kind of opens up and that seed, the very first thing is roots are being set. And before the seed, you can even see it in this picture, it's just now starting to break the surface. We already have, I don't know, three inches of root down there. This becomes really important when you want to shift your uh, perspective for watering, which we'll get into a little bit later. <clears throat> Uh, we already went through this water, appropriate temperature, and oxygen. So now we know the value of seeds, the importance, the benefits that they bring. <clears throat> we know the anatomy of the seeds, some different genetic modifications that are for uh, how they survive. So how do we actually put these in? There is a little tab on each of our products on our website. If you go to them, uh, at the bottom, it says, well, it used to be, it might have changed. It's called Read the Land. And one of the perspectives that we need to shift is that we don't need to go through a catalog and find a flower that's pretty and say, I want that flower and force it to work in the landscape. You need to take the landscape, read the land, and see what it's telling you, and then match the appropriate species to that. Right? So some species work in shade, some in sun, some in high and low pHs, all that different type of stuff. Here, so I'm going to kind of bounce through a few different projects. This is actually my house. Um, I bought my first house in 20, well, only house, but first house, in 2018. And luckily, I work at a seed company, so I got access to a bunch of seeds. But man, it's been a challenge and still working on the same dang project because I didn't go through these steps. So I want to share a lot of my failures with you guys. Pick the location. I first started off, everyone wants as much turf as possible, which is not really the right mindset either. Uh, I knew I didn't want all turf, but I wanted a large portion of turf in this area. If you see the next slide, you can tell how much shade there is. So I have trimmed some of the tree, uh, tree limbs out, get some more, a better canopy and all that stuff. But you can see I got some shade species, a lot of them coming up. This is where my turf area is and not the greatest picture, but it's, it's, it's much more solid over here, but you can see where that shade ring is of this tree. And that in itself is an example of how to read the land. You want to try and force it to take a sun-loving plant like buffalo grass. You cannot force nature to work at your schedule or for your desires. So number one thing I would say is location and read the land, match the seeds to the project, not to your desires. <laughs> Next up, soil preparation, which kind of also ties into invasive species control. This is where I really... Uh, was not patient enough. Um, this is also a pretty complex and deep subject that could take an entire presentation in itself. I'll kind of quickly summarize here. Um, this had some scattered San Augustine and Bermuda grass. And if you know anything about Bermuda grass, it is a tough, tough plant. It grows from runners and stolons. It adapted in Africa where there's long periods of drought and elephants running on it and all sorts of stuff. So it's really hard to get rid of. I knew that going into it, for better or worse, uh, I view uh, Bermuda grass as a cancer to our landscape. And the only way to get rid of cancer, as far as we know now, is chemo. So I went the Roundup route. So that being said, this was in the fall of 2018. 
sprayed around up uh, in the late uh, late summer, early fall when it was still green. Those plants, the way Roundup works is that it soaks that poison up, so they have to be actively growing. A good time to do that is on a cool day when it, when they're they've had good moisture. If you're in the middle of a drought, you try and spray something, you're not going to get that great of results. So I did that once. I did that twice in the fall. You usually need to wait 15 to 30 days in between. And it was still green enough, and I sprayed it again. Waited seven days, and then I said, okay, I'm going to till this under. And soil preparation, um, if you want to do some tilling, I mean, this is just time lapse of it, but you can change the landscape pretty quickly, right? This took an afternoon. And um, I knew that Bermuda, especially if you're going to till it up, that they have, one, I'm disturbing the soil bank that's already in there. So I'm going to bring up new seeds that are dormant laying there. And two, I don't want to just let it sit like this for the whole winter. So I'm going to put a cover crop on. So I put a zero rye green cover crop, let some stuff grow, shred it. I sprayed it three more times the next spring. And I said, okay, that's enough spraying. I'm tired of this. I'm going to plant my grass. Well, for the last four or five years, I've been dealing with weeds because I was not patient enough. And I wanted nature to go at my uh, tempo whenever I need to be patient and um, read the land in that sense. So that's one big lesson. Uh, we've we've had some projects, larger projects that we worked on for TPWD or other uh, bigger bigger land areas where we spent upwards of three to four years just controlling invasives before we start doing any shifts. And sadly, that's just where we are. Um, there, I don't think we will ever control them all. There, there's you know some. Some advantages that invasive have, they don't have any natural predators, you know, so um, they're a lot harder to get rid of, and a lot of them are just so aggressive um, <clears throat> that it's just hard to get rid of. So nature's not going to uh, adjust her timeline to meet your schedule, and I have this question a lot. People call in, I have a Bermuda grass yard. I like the idea of natives. I uh, switch over to buffalo grass or thunder turf. But uh, my Bermuda grass looks bad. I don't think it's alive. Can I just put seeds down and, and it'll overtake what Bermuda? Uh, I wish that it were that easy, but my comparison, since I did play football, that's like taking a middle school football player and going against a professional player. <laughs> In the sense that you have a little buffalo grass, baby seedling, and you have well-established Bermuda grass, there's no way that balance is going to work. So you have to put in that upfront work. So... Now we're going to shift up to George. If anyone knows George, he's my brother-in-law. He is uh, very, very, very knowledgeable in native seeds and restoration. This is his parents' uh, house up in Sherman, so up in North Texas. You, know, you can see the exterior border. They kind of redid some um, flower beds, and then they were doing the same thing in their uh, their landscape area, the lawn area that they're going to convert Bermuda to to thunder turf and. Um, they also spent the same amount of time controlling invasives. And you can see he also did tilling. So whenever you talk about soil preparation, you might think, okay, I see bare soil. Let's go ahead and put the seeds out. You could do it now and you would get some decent benefits. One of the main things that you want to want to focus on when putting seeds out is getting good seed to soil contact. All right. You a good rule of thumb is you don't want to bury native seeds more than double their diameter for the most part, which is deeper than a quarter of an inch, unless you're doing maybe Eastern gamma grass, you can go down to half an inch or buffalo grass. But for the most part, you wanna keep them shallow. If they're on the surface, that's okay. But the main thing is you wanna loosen up the topsoil. <clears throat> if you're gonna till, you need to realize that you're gonna bring up new weed seeds. One strategy that you could do is that if you have a blank uh, soil here, then you go ahead and water that and see what comes up, just try and get a kill before you plant your seeds in. Um, <clears throat> But uh, I would recommend trying to fully prepare a seed bed. And notice the difference between the previous slide and this one. One, we raked out all the unutensils. So if you were to plant seeds in here, you get your first rain. This is loose soil that's going to end up evening itself out. And some of the seeds that are on top of these ridges are either going to wash down, or some that are in the bottom ridges are going to be buried too deep, and you're going to get some scattered results. Those scattered results are going to allow opportunities for other weeds to come up. So trying to create a nice uh, even seed, well prepared seed bed is key. Notice they raked all the thatch off to the side. Very little debris and large uh, objects that you have to go around. So, once the seed bed is prepared, then we go into the actual act of seeding itself. Um, for smaller areas, I, I prefer doing uh, 
hand broadcasting, uh, just like feeding chickens. Um, and a good rule of thumb too, whenever you're doing seeding, whether it's with hand broadcasters or these whirly bird seed slingers, is to try and split your seed into half. So let's say you have 5,000 square feet and you have 10 pounds. You're gonna take five pounds and you're gonna plant walking this way. You take the other five pounds, you're gonna cross hatch it and plant this way. That way you don't have any lines and you have better coverage area. Um, another good rule of thumb is to get a bit extra seed for areas that don't take initially that you can fill in over time. Um, so for me, that hand seeding, depending on the project and species and all that, usually I'll do up to a quarter acre with my hand. If I want to go into bigger areas, I could do these whirly birds. Um, there's two things to know about natives too. Um, imagine that broom sedge blue stem seed, very, very light and fluffy. If you put it into a standard cloth bag seed slinger, it's not going to flow. It just won't work. So there are some specialized um, equipment. Truex makes these. Really great guy. I know the guy started this company himself. He's 85 years now and still uh, rocking. Uh, but they're pretty pricey. But on the inside, they have an agitation wheel that actually picks those seeds, puts them down, and, and disperses them. Um, for larger projects, if you're doing those, then they have what is called no-till drill. Uh, and that basically, you can see on this wheel, it's an open V here. And there's a tube up top that drops that seed in. So that V is cutting a slit or a furrow in the ground right at, so there's depth band, that's three eighths of an inch. So that's as deep as it cuts, not putting it too deep. Drops that seed in right behind this. There's another wheel that rolls over and packs it in. And it looks something like this. Whenever it's done, you can see that furrow and there's some seeds in there, some on top and some buried. The main thing about seeding is getting that good seed to soil contact. So even if you have some on top, that's okay but would recommend trying to roll or stomp it in so you get that good integration for good germination. Now, once you're done planting, <clears throat> talk about water. One of the, well, there's three essential things that you need for seeds, right? Oxygen, well, there's oxygen there. Temperature, this is a warm season species, 100 degrees, July 20th is the day that this was planted, and water. Shifting perspective again, trying to go back into thinking like a seed. We have a side profile of soil, let's say just the top uh, 12 inches. Those seeds are planted at the top quarter. You might, the very first time, it might be smart to do a deep soaking watering so all this soil is saturated. But when this acts like a sponge, heat is coming from top and the top is drying out first. So what you want to do at the beginning is try and keep that water where the seed is. What that means is high frequency, short duration. Um, what I'd recommend is trying to automate. And nowadays world, you can get one of these for $50, run two zones with the hose and the impact sprinkler, and somewhere about four or five times a day, five, 10 minutes at a time. All you're trying to do is let that top quarter half inch get wet and then dry out. Get wet and dry out, get wet and dry out. You don't wanna let it dry out too long, but you wanna let it dry out because that makes that seed coat shrink and expand through those different, uh, moisture levels, and that's what makes things germinate. Remember too, that once things germinate, <clears throat> this is a buffalo grass seed, you can see it is sitting on top, <clears throat> and this seed coat actually has five seeds or more in this little coat, and two have germinated, it looks like, but whenever you see on top, you probably see that same distance or double it down below. So when you start seeing germination, you want to start backing off on your frequency and increasing your duration. Instead of five times a day, go down to three or two, 10 to 20 to 30 minutes. You know, it all depends on all your variables. But the goal, here's some more germination of a trip seed. The goal is that when your seedling is up here and then it starts emerging, it's already got double the distance down. Now, the roots is the strength of the seed. And so what you want to do is try and keep that water right below that root level so it's having to go down and search deep. And this is really just during establishment periods. Once things are established, then you do want to do deep waterings. But the goal is to try and get as deep as roots as possible, because that's going to make the plant as strong as possible. Coconut mesh that was you put on top. Anyone know what that's called? I'll give you a word for that. Blanket. Erosion control blanket. It is a wood fiber. <laughs> it is a wood fiber. And so I'm glad you brought that up. Don't put that on it. I sure did. Encouraging growth. Two things about this picture. A lot of times we'll have customers called in and we could all learn from this uh, 
lecture on perspective. They'll call in, they'll send us a picture that does not have this part in it, and they say, I did everything you said and nothing has come up. And that's because we're looking at something from 15 feet away or going 90 miles down the highway and think that we know that that is the reality. Get in close and get your hands a little bit dirty and connected to the earth, and you'll see that growth and things are happening. So that's number one is the perspective. Number two, this wood fiber blanket um, or erosion blanket is typically used for steep sloped areas or areas that are going to erode with wind or uh, water erosion. But you notice here, this is inside of a fenced area on a very flat uh, landscape. The reason for that is it, it's almost in a way mimicking nature. If you think about annual wildflowers, they're going to come up, they're going to bloom, they're going to die in nature, <clears throat> but they're still going to have those stalks there. And so there's going to be empty space underneath. And the, that then when the warm season comes, those grasses start coming up and emerging. And those stalks in themselves are creating a growing environment and habitat for those warm season species. They're holding moisture down. They're keeping the sun off. They're keeping predators and wind erosion from getting to it. Wood blankets do the exact same thing. So it'll protect your seeds. Obviously, it's a higher upfront cost, but it'll protect your seeds and it holds moisture in, so it reduces your water. George, I talked to him about this yesterday, actually, and he said he estimated that you would use 25% of what you would normally use water to get things established with this blanket. It deteriorates over the first year. Um, it's just, I mean, it is a challenge to put put out and uh, cost a little bit more upfront. Yes, ma'am. So do you put the blanket down right after the seeds or do you wait till there's some growth? You put, it would it would be preferred that you put it down right after right. because they will find their way. Right. 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 Yep. And some people ask, do the seeds come in with the blankets? No, they're separate. You can do them, you know, and so some, you can see <laughs> similar things like this on the side of the highway, you know, where they do those. Impregnated. Yeah, yeah. And they have those seeds in there, but there's two different types of blankets, too, since we're on this subject. This is a wood fiber, and you see there's one string that holds it together. Otherwise, just the wood fiber is uh, is holding it together. There are some that have plastic netting that holds them together. We used to carry those before they came out with these, and we did some on some large projects, and you would find dead snakes, birds, horny toads, all sorts of stuff. They are cheaper, but there's a cost for everything. So this is after one week. You can see there's just barely a bit there. This is 16 days later. You can see now, okay, so now we're at that teenager stage. The critical point here that I see with a lot of people on projects is that you get something going, you act like mother nature, you're providing water, you're forcing those seeds to come up, and then you say, oh, they're coming up, that's all I need to do, and then you back off on the water. These plants aren't fully established yet, so you're trying to tell that plant it's the right environment to grow, and then you change its environment. So continue with that water. All it's going to take is another 15 days, and you'll get to basically a fully established farm. Easy as that. Yeah. yeah. So um, we talk about that. If you get to this point, there is a lot of upfront work to go, but the benefit is that uh, then I can go all the way back on. Um, on that root slide, on the far right was buffalo grass. It's a 12 inch tall plant at max height. It has roots that go down eight feet deep. So if you see there on that same graph on the left side, there was Kentucky bluegrass where it's a 12 inch plant and it has six inch roots. You know, what's gonna win whenever drought happens, which is gonna happen in Texas. But once this is established, we get into the maintenance phase. Um, this also in itself could be a whole uh, <clears throat> discussion or a whole presentation. But I'm just gonna lightly touch on mowing since that's typically what most people do for maintenance, especially in a landscape setting. Um, a few, few things, but the very overarching thing is before you get your mower out, understand why you're even mowing in the first place. Are you mowing because you have an HOA and you have to? Are you mowing because you're trying to keep up with the Joneses and an article came out 15 years ago that you're supposed to mow every two weeks? Are you trying to mow at the lowest level to make it look like a golf course? Because that's going to require more inputs to keep those plants alive and allow more opportunities for weeds to come in. Are you mowing to try and create some sort of soft edges? In architecture, almost everything we have is a straight line. So the only way to soften that up is through the landscape by creating these soft edges. Another thing to note is, are you mowing annuals or perennials? If it's an annual, you're only going to have seeds from that plant for the next year. So you better wait for them to set. 
Here is a blue bonnet seed pod, if you've ever seen one. I still wouldn't even mow at this level because they have not bursted open. And if you've ever been in a blue bonnet field when they're bursting, it's pretty cool. Sounds like popcorn and you can see right there what happens. So pretty much through the entire presentation, except for um, how to pick the right kind of seeds. If the internet doesn't work, well, let's just test it and see. This is on our webpage. Maybe. There we go. There we go. Okay, so we just got a new website this year. <laughs> well, it's almost, I don't know, it's probably that technology thing. It's supposed to work for you, but then you end up working for it. <laughs> <laughs> So you get to our homepage. If you scroll all the way down the bottom, it's kind of hidden. We haven't even got figured out yet, but you will see that same eco region map. This is an interactive map. And if you say, you know, we're in Edwards Plateau, you can kind of hover over and see all these eco regions and what they are. But we're in Edwards Plateau, so we'll click that. This in itself is a filtering tool. We have 173 species and 40, no, 33 uh, seed mixes. So trying to find the right one is a bit of a challenge. We've tried to get back up into this artificial intelligence stage or just use a little bit of automation to start filtering through these. So you can see we have nine tabs of, I don't know, 15, 25 uh, species on the page. And the first thing that we're gonna do is location. So each of these locations, each of these plants have uh, native ranges and those are all in the database on our back end that is being accessed. And uh, one of the first main things you want to know is what type of sunlight do you have? So most people want to know about shade. We'll go through that. And then soil type. Uh, if you don't know, you can hover over this, get a little bit of information. Or if you don't know, you can just skip. <laughs> How about the soil moisture? Okay, let's say medium. Do you have any uh, benefits you're looking for? Basically, this is just a filtering tool, um, but it goes through all the categories that we have of our plant database on the back end to recommend species. There are people that actually click on deer palatable. Yeah, there's some people that want to feed deer. And I'm like, man, you are crazy, aren't you? That's correct. That's <laughs> <right. laughs> so uh, as we mentioned, our, our products, what we recommend first is gonna be mixes. Uh, if you wanna scroll down, you can find other. Okay, so here's some shade friendly species. Inland sea oats, we know that works. Prairie wild dry, Virginia wild dry blue mist flower, gamma grass, blue curls. So if you are ever trying to find some species, here's a way to do it. And uh, some of the other filter questions are your bloom time, your height, and your, your type. So if you only wanted wildflowers instead of mixes, you can go select individual species and see what those are, or the color, I think. Oh, and the uh, plant. Here is an actual plant. You know, you get into how well this works uh, for your area. You can find all this information right here, the seeding rate. So we have a lawn and garden rate, which is used if you're doing something around your house and trying to get good results quickly. And open space if you're trying to do land restoration on a larger scale. So those seeding rates are adjusted for that. We have what we have available here. This one's pretty pricey on the high end uh, of bulk pounds, but you scroll all the way down and you get a description and you can go to this read the land tab which ties into plants.usda.gov and gives you what the government thinks about this plant <laughs> right or wrong <laughs> and let's scroll you can see that it's native ranges in texas you can zoom in and zoom in and you can figure out what counties it grows in and here we are in the edwards plateau it's in that area so that really for the most part, sums up our journey uh, today. But I'm going to end with a quote from Aldo Leopold. If you take one thing away, I think that this would sum everything up. Conservation is a state of harmony between men and land. By land is meant all things on, over, or in the earth. Harmony with land is like harmony with a friend. You cannot cherish his right hand and chop off his left. <laughs> so let's start figuring out how to work together to ensure that we got this human species keep going into the future. Any questions? I'm like you. I think preparation is probably the most important part of the whole journey. 
Have you thought about or ever tried solarization to get rid of the? How did that work for you? Um, was the area too large? It, yeah. So there's some challenge. There's some pros and cons with everything, give or take. Right. Solarization and um, sheet mulching have been effective, but it's a it's it's hard to do at scale because you have to do large areas. And then there's also the challenge of what the landscape is like. Is it on a slope or not? Is it going to be in areas where wildlife is walking on that? that solar uh, sheet and po poking holes in it, you know, anything that comes through sunlight will allow that, that plant will find that way through. So second question, have you tried doing one small area and hoping that it spreads into other areas? Or one you just say, do the whole three quarters of an acre at one time? Are you talking about for solarization or for? Uh, no, for actually uh, restoration. establishing. Um, a lot of that boils down to uh, your budget and your capability to restart a project. Most of the time, you're going to get economies of scale doing it all at once because there's setup costs and mobilization costs, and moving costs, and, you know, and just sticking through a small area is challenging because every single time you have, it's like starting a whole new project. You know? So we find that you go at a larger scale, it works better. Uh, but if you're still learning, I mean, I don't think there's any, there's pros and cons to each approach and if you're learning and if you if you don't have that land figured out and what's going to work then i would recommend starting with a small sample area first and finding a solution and then expanding that to the whole project for your personal project in your backyard mm -hmm. i don't want to sound like i'm dumb or something but did you consider slotting i mean you own a seed company so that's probably a good yeah thing to do. or either just putting you know, plugs and plugs. plugs yeah um so on that picture in the in the shady area that texas bluegrass doesn't work from seeds so i did do that from plugs and i did some of the shady areas from plugs the challenge with the sod on the turf level is that as far as i know there's not any native turf that's in sod that's a viable option there are some buffalo grass sods but as i mentioned before there's a male plant and a female plant and typically what they do is only take the female plant because it doesn't shoot a tall stem up and First year it'll look great, but then over time it won't continue that that expansion because it doesn't have that cross pollination, and so it ends up thinning out. Plus the cost up front, plus just uh, I mean I like to see the actual whole process. Sod is I mean it depends, you know. It's like almost like the same domain that we're trying to control nature that we just instantly get something in. You know? Yeah. You want your input on this? Uh, we have a pretty good stand of. Blue bonnets here every spring. People come here to get their pictures done. Mm -hmm. uh, but we harvest every year. We've been harvesting. We started five plants. Anyway, uh, this year something happened that's never happened before because normally what I do is I harvest and I mimic nature. It's putting seeds out. Mm -hmm. What is it, Jen? Something like that. Mm -hmm. so, as soon as I harvest them, I'm spreading them. This year I didn't because of the drought. I still got them. They're nicely stored. When do you suggest? I know they say into September on in October, but I mean we don't. It doesn't look like we're getting any rain. What What's your suggestion for when I should spread these? I do what you say. I'm looking for bare ground. So what I'm trying to do is expand mm -hmm. the coverage of our blue bonnets. When When What should I do this year? Well, it's, uh, there's no uh, absolute answer to that. But the best input I would say is what you're trying to do is, is predict the future and when water's going to come, right? And that's pretty challenging in itself. Weathermen, that's their job. They barely get it right. Um, there's a few kind of strategies. The blue bonnets themselves, they've gone through maybe worse times than this. I don't know. This year was we broke record for the most days over 100 degrees. You know, we don't I'm, even have sprouts because needless to say, it spread all kinds of seed around here. Normally, mm -hmm. we're covered up with sprouts. Almost no sprouts. The deal, yeah. So the deal with natives and timing, timing is a thing about planting if you're trying to get those immediate results. But these natives, they're adapted. They're going to know when the conditions are right. You could put them out. You might not see results that first year, but that will at least stay in that soil seed bank. And when the conditions are right, they will come up. So you could do what you're continuing to do and put them out in the uh, in the in the summer when they would naturally fall and just be patient and understand if they don't come up the first year, second year, third year, you know, it might take some time. The other thing you can do is if you do know that either you're trying to uh, expand those purposefully, i.e. you're going to end up watering them, I wouldn't put them down. Okay, so if you're not going to water, if you were, 
Or if you are going to put them out later, you can improve that germination if you're trying to force it by doing that scarification if you're going to plant them later. The thing about the blue bonnets, they drop themselves and they sit there all summer and they get hot mm -hmm. and then they start getting cold and they every time it rains, they're shrinking and swelling. And so it's slowly breaking down that seed coat. So I would continue to do what you're doing and spreading them out, whether there's rain or not. If this is if you're gonna let na nature do its thing, so I don't need to watch for oh it looks like El yep. Nino five to be in my fall rain. I should, you should just go ahead and get them out when I have the time. Yeah, when you're when you're able to. I mean, there is some benefit because if you put them out originally, there's going to be some predation or some loss. You know, whether animals get them or whatever. But that's nature in itself. Even if you can't control all the variables, so allow nature to do its thing. And the the main thing is that. What's going to be better if you hold on to those seeds in your closet for five years or you put them out in the soil and you get some results? Yeah. We need to wrap it up. Wrap it up. Yep. Take a link of question. Yep. So how much is in a deep pack? Oh, good. A lot of people ask that question. Right. Each deep pack is different. Um, deep pack stands for diversity. So it's if you want more than a packet and less than a pound. Uh, the deep packs all have different weight ranges and it's based on what works to fit the package, how much availability we have, and the square foot we're trying to cover. So Check that all on the website. It'll tell you how much square foot it covers. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you, guys.